happy to be here. <laughs> so uh, you grew up in Tel Aviv? Yes. No, I actually I grew up um, in the suburbs. Okay. But um, I spent a lot of time in Tel Aviv. My grandparents lived here and mm -hmm. spent a lot of my time. And then I moved <laughs> here when I was 18. Oh, wow. Okay. Like most of Israel, I guess, wants to do. So your, your great-grandfather was one of the founders of Petach Tifa, right? Yes, that's absolutely true. Wow. Is there like a plaque there? Is there yeah, there is of... a plaque, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the a of... statue, I believe. Really? Yeah. 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 Wow. It's, I, I don't know anybody else who has like a relative <laughs> statue. That's, that's He's pretty... sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so Petar Tikva wasn't enough to lure you away from Tel Aviv? It's, it's, no. no. <laughs> um, I mean, we did, my other grandmother lived in Petar Tikva and we were there a lot. And I mm. still feel uh, the place is very dear to my heart, but mm. um, I never lived there. So what was the music scene like when you were a teenager? Like, who did you listen to? Who, uh, who, influ who influenced you? Who did you, did you want to be, you know, anybody in particular? I wanted to be Patti Smith. I wanted to be Joni Mitchell. Um, I wanted to be Corinne Alal and, uh, and Laurie Anderson. Mm -hmm. And I think in between these four, mm -hmm. Founding mothers mm -hmm. is actually where I find myself, and I think later on, um, Aouva Ozeri was added to this list. And in between those great uh, women, I find my inspiration. So you still you still draw on them from your uh... absolutely. And I had the privilege uh, of working with two of them, mm -hmm. Aouva Ozeri, before she uh, died. We actually DJed together. It sounds very strange to say, as she wasn't a DJ, but she DJed one night in this place where uh, I played also. And we also uh, cooperated on a um, music for a theater piece mm -hmm. a few years ago. And that was uh, a dream come true yeah. to do something with her. And Corinna Lal and me have been working together for several years now. So, and she's, she's a one of the greatest teachers I ever met. Yeah. The first band that you started was your brother's band, I guess, that you were involved in? I, they let me join. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, so that you asked, they didn't pull you in? I used to just hang around with them. I was 15, yeah. they were 18, they were, they it seemed to me like they knew it all. Yeah. And they taught me more or less everything I knew about being in a band yeah and uh it was only later on after they had finished the army and i was in the army they lost a drummer because he was a, a pilot in the army mm. and he wasn't available anymore to jam with them mm. they asked me to step in as a drummer mm -hmm. and uh we played uh, arad festival and actually we opened for corinna lal wow. that was 85 and yeah. i was like oh mm, okay then and um Later on, they all went to do other things, and um, I continued with the music. And actually, when uh, I left the country when I was 21, mm. and when I came back after a year, just for a few weeks holiday, I recorded a few songs at home with my brother, who was in the band. And when we needed a, a bass player and a guitarist, we very naturally called upon our friends from his old band. Right. And that's how actually the, the classic Pollyanna Frank lineup um, got together. Oh, wow. T tell us a little bit more about that, about Pollyanna well, Frank. What we did was we recorded eight songs at home mm -hmm. uh, on a four track recorder, just wow. as simple as could be. Mm. And we really did, did not uh, intend to release any of it. Mm. But um, some guy we knew just took it to this new indie label that started in Tel Aviv, the third year, I was in a shlishit, and they decided to release it as a cassette. Mm -hmm. And the cassette was doing really well very, very quickly because it was very different from other things that were being released in Israel at the time. It mm. was so very free form and outspoken and probably because it wasn't meant to be released. Right. Um, and we quite frankly, didn't belong to any scene or didn't much care mm -hmm. of what people would make of it. We just kind of really 
recorded what was in our hearts, and I think that's always the best way with music, if you or anything, mm -hmm. if you can really focus on what you want to say and shut out the whole world around you, you you'll come out with something quite unique, and that was it. So were you expecting to be, that it would be picked up, or that it was no. just, yeah? And I wasn't in the country when it was released, and all of a sudden I got this phone call, and they said, well, it's selling thousands. I said, of what? Like, <laughs> what? And uh, please come and do some gigs. So we weren't actually a functioning band at mm -hmm. that point, and we never were. Right. So you were just a studio? A studio. We were just a group of friends right. who got together once in a while. So we did okay. that album and the next album mm -hmm. the year later, 1990. Right. right and some gigs, but we were living in three different countries. Mm -hmm. Now it's four different countries. Mm -hmm. And um, so we get together once in a while. Obviously, we're still best friends, and one of them is my brother. So. Yeah. Um, ten years ago or nine years ago, we did a, a big gig together, mm -hmm. celebrating 20 years for the album. But um, we were always sort of a project, an ongoing project, and not a functioning band. So, so do you still collaborate with them? Do you still write with them? Or is Absolutely. It, okay. How do you collaborate um, when you're so r remotely located? Well, all four of us have home studios. Well, okay. not so home. My, my studio is not a home studio anymore, but mm. pretty good studios, and we send each other stuff. Right. And um, so we collaborate with each other, not so much with the writing, but with the playing instruments and doing backing vocals or anything that anybody needs. So how does it work? Is you like you, the person who writes the piece of music, lays down a track, and then you ask other people to? Yes. Okay. You send it to them. Okay. And it comes back with a bass guitar or with a very weird noises or anything that anybody right. wants to come up with. Yeah. So do you, when you send it out, do you provide like any kind of instructions? Like this is what I'm looking for, or they just say like this is what I'm given to start with. Let me see what I can build around this core. I think by now we've known each other for so long because oh, actually we, we're friends since high school. Mm. That there's no instructions needed, and I'm sure all of you in your work have people like that that you know you can collaborate with, and just no, no words necessary. Mm -hmm. You just send it and see what they come up with. Right. Wow. Are you surprised at what people come up with? Um, Ever like does it yeah, come back yeah. to you like come back that was totally unexpected or absolutely but I mean I think yeah. across the board in everything yeah. that I do it's right. I love being surprised what what other the other souls that I'm creating with what they come up with it's yeah. beautiful yeah otherwise you sort of shut up in your own world and um, there's a limit to how often you can renew yourself. <clears throat> You know, it's mm. nice to work with other people. Do you enjoy performance, or do you prefer more the composition? Do you like prefer performing in front of a live audience? Does that feed you? Or do you prefer studio work? I like all of it. Yeah. Equally, I would say. Yeah. I go a bit crazy if I don't perform for a while, mm. and then you know, if I perform a lot, then I miss the studio and I miss just being quiet and working on something and then all of a sudden realizing that I've been there for eight straight hours, did not drink, did not go to the ladies room, nothing. Yeah. So I like that as well, going into my own tunnel. You mentioned that you left the country. You were, you were out of the country for, for quite a while. It was, like, what, I think, first Amsterdam and, and then London. London. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose those two countries? I knew some people there. I went there straight after the army just to check things out mm -hmm. and I met a lot of people. Was lucky enough to meet uh, a lot of women right away who would become my friends till this very day. Mm. And so I knew kind of where I was going and I stayed in Amsterdam for a couple of years, but uh, I really wanted to make music and London was a lot more of a music city. Right. So I moved there and all in all I was away for about 14 years. Was there a lot of culture shock for you moving there? Absolutely, well, Amsterdam home? and Tel Aviv, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's funny because Amsterdam and Tel Aviv at the time were of about the same size. Mm -hmm. And with both of them, I would say that the music uh, scene was kind of sleepy in the same way. Mm -hmm. But um, electronic music was just 
starting up and it started exploding in Amsterdam and even more so in London. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a big difference from Tel Aviv and that really interested me. So you said that you had like a, a bigger shock going to Amsterdam than to, to London or? Um, yeah, why? I think um, well, London is a cosmopolitan city. Yeah. It's very mixed. Mm -hmm. And Amsterdam is very Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very like, um, you know, you could be sitting in a squat, which I was living in a squat, um, with like the most left wing uh, anarchist person you've ever met in your life. Just kind of trying to uh, absorb, you know, all these new ideas. And then you say to some, that someone, uh, okay, so how about we go to the movies next week? And, or how, you know, let's meet up again. And they, bring out their diary <laughs> and they say well you know a month from now on Tuesday afternoon I right. have time okay. between four and six and <laughs> that is so un-Israeli right that was right. that was my big shock right in the beginning right everything is very structured um timed yeah controlled um it took me a long time to read the body language oh yeah a, a, to decipher in the beginning, I thought nobody wanted to be my friend in a way, you know what I mean? Right, right. N not in a hostile way, but I thought they were being quite um, uninterested, whereas they were just being them. Right, right. I mean, Israelis, you know what they're thinking. <laughs> Absolutely. And, <laughs> and I guess sort of Northern Europeans, you, it's, it's different. And London is, uh, you know, it's a huge monster of a city. Yeah. And people are brasher and they're more energetic and mm -hmm. it's more chaotic and mm -hmm. when you were living abroad did you come home at all or you were like just away for the whole about once a year okay okay um what did you miss did you miss anything while you were there or it's just you just needed it uh the first few years i didn't miss the place so much uh i guess i needed the time away this is a very intense place right but as time progressed, I was missing it until I finally came back. And yeah. I think, um, well, the weather in London is so fantastic, yeah. as you know. Um, it's but funny. I wasn't, you're, the, you're the second yeah. Israeli I've met who, who <laughs> says that, and I think only Israelis would ever say that. No, I mean, I'm being, like, very sarcastic. Oh, okay. No, it's, I, I, okay. it's abysmal. <laughs> it's just always gray. It's, you know, and, and yeah, well... <laughs> So, uh, having having grown up here and lived twenty odd years in the sunshine, I was I welcomed the rain with open arms and the grayness and the cold and everything. And then about ten years go by, and then one day I just looked out of my window and I said, "I miss the sunshine. I need the sunshine right now." And that was it. Like I, yeah. there was no going back after that. Yeah. And. Um, uh, I, I love this place. I love this place dearly. I'm of here. I am part of this earth. Mm. I'm part of this place very much so. Mm. Uh, and I was happy to um, have the privilege to choose where to live. And I chose mm -hmm. to live here. When you were there, were you mostly with other Israelis or other musicians or other expats, like non-British people? None. Or it was years before I knew any Israelis in London, mm -hmm. one or two friends, but no. no. I, lived, um, I lived in a big house with five other women mm -hmm. for many, many years. And they were a Dutch, a German, Irish, English, and Scottish. Was the language a, a problem for you, or was it no. comfortable? Okay. I lived in the States when I was in high school. Okay. So my English was pretty good, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I was told on my first week in London to lose my American accent pronto. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to be taken seriously, lose the accent. <laughs> you're not American, are you? So if you're American, mm -hmm. okay, what can you do? Tough luck. Right. But if you are American, then, you know, yeah. lose the accent. Right. And so right. uh, I did. Oh. Um, I have to say the, the music scene in London at the time was such that if you had a non-British accent, mm -hmm. also meaning Australian, New Zealand, mm -hmm. Y you did not get jobs. You did really? not. Yeah, you were not taken seriously at all. 
Even even in song, because like Absolutely. I find quite often in music the accent tends to be less. less This is because yeah. the singers yeah. lose it, lose yeah. their original accent. Okay. you know. Also, I think uh, part of the whole revolution of of was that uh, people with uh, working class accents, whether it's Northern or Cockney, mm -hmm. also their accents were not uh, acceptable right. in, in music, and then all of a sudden people. Um, like Billy Bragg, you know, would sing in their natural accent, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a revolution. So also the Israeli accent was. Right. Um, so do you find in music now, it's a, it's a little bit more either acceptable or even yes, it's in, lot, interesting yeah. if you speak in it. It's a it's yeah. it's a lot more acceptable and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's easier, definitely. When you when you perform there, did you? perform in Hebrew much? Was it mostly in English? All in English. Never no, Hebrew Never in Hebrew, no. Okay. Was that because you just felt it was more appropriate or, or that you would get more gigs that way? Or I didn't feel the need in the beginning to mm. perform in Hebrew at all. And you do want your audience to... Uh, words are very important to me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted my audience to understand what I was saying. Okay. Have you ever performed in Hebrew to non-Hebrew audiences specifically? Yes. Well, um, later on, um, I would say maybe 2002, mm. three, four, five, um, the next re reincarnation of uh, Pollyanna Frank as a duo with me and Frank Elfman, who is another Israeli living in London, mm -hmm. uh, who's an award-winning film composer who works mm -hmm. in Hollywood a lot. Um, and we met in London in 99, I think, and immediately started working together because we really loved right. what, what we brought into this um, corporation. And um, we performed as Pollyanna Frank in London in some very nice venues, and some of the stuff was in Hebrew. Mm. And uh, people reacted beautifully. Tell me about how they react in, uh, to, to songs spoken Uh, sung in Hebrew, you know, like, how does it affect them? Do they do any of them know the words? Can They didn't know the words, but um, I think the best thing to do actually is to sing a bilingual song where you're singing mm -hmm. the same words in English and then in Hebrew, right. and they, they really get into the Hebrew to, to the sound of this weird yeah. old language, yeah. but then if you sing the next uh, verse in English, they know what you're talking about, and right. as my lyrics tend to be... Um, Um, also quite political a lot mm. of the time. Mm. Uh, it was important to me that they know what I'm talking about. Right. So y your music in the beginning was was quite political. These days, not as much, correct? Or no. is it, yeah? It still is, very much. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, is it about the same things? Is it about different things that interest you these days? Well, not much has changed, has yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> When I say political, I mean many things. Okay. So, It can be um, uh, the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians. It mm -hmm. could also mean uh, gender politics, mm -hmm. uh, gay politics. Mm -hmm. could be just, you know. Right. So all of those, basically, the, you think the, the topics of, of discussion are more or less the same thing, even though I, you know, some of those areas have advanced. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. Yeah. There is a huge change, yeah. but... The problems are still there, right. I guess, or right. things that interest me. I guess if you are, um, uh, you should always write about or create about the things that um, really move your soul. And these right. things are important to me. So I don't write about them because I should. Right. I write about them when I am overwhelmed with what I feel and my only way of <laughs> um, uh, Continuing to live in this world, as yeah. it were, is to create and write about it. Right. That's the way I go on. Right. You know. Right. Okay. Balancing it. You were, I think, one of the the first musicians, at least in Israel, to come out openly. The first. Um, yeah. The first. Was it planned? Did it just happen? It wasn't planned at all. But yeah. um, as a, as I said, I I already lived in. A, in Amsterdam by then for about a year or right. more. And I lived a very open, free life over mm -hmm. there. And when I came back here, 
with this cassette that all of a sudden became a big hit and uh, I was uh, being interviewed I guess for a whole day uh, I had a different interview every hour mm -hmm. and I was 22 year old totally inexperienced uh, girl uh, who did really not know how you behave with the media at all yeah. and I got asked uh, somebody said at one point well there's is a love song in this album that is very clearly addressed to mm. a woman mm. so how come and I said well what do you mean and they said well are you a lesbian and I said yeah, yeah. Okay. I was you know just lying was yeah. uh, just seems unnatural it seemed totally um, yeah. such an effort to lie about it it seemed ridiculous to lie about it. And how, um, how was it received here? Oh, it was insane. <laughs> it was absolutely insane. Yeah. It was insane. You have to remember that we only had one television channel at the time mm -hmm. and not very many radio stations mm -hmm. and a few newspapers. So if you were in those and I was in all of them because, mm -hmm. you know, the media is just they tripped over themselves. They could not believe that they finally got a victim to come out um, publicly. Right. Um, so they all wanted to interview us and, um, you know, write about us and put th those these ridiculous um, uh, headlines like, uh, she's a lesbian and she likes it. You know, like, uh, I should be apologizing <laughs> yeah. for something or, uh, you know, like telling them some, you know, woe stories or whatever uh so it, it became very big very fast right. And right definitely we were not ready for that did other artists reach out to you to ask you sort of advice or like much later on yeah much later. do they on. still or is it just now it's like people don't even think about it no they still do yeah yeah right, sometimes yeah. yeah okay so was the song you were talking about was Ziva, right? Or was it a different but, song? Um, no, no, Ziva is not really a love song, I would say, or okay. maybe kind of, but I have to say, I didn't write Ziva. Right. Our guitarist, Ami, wrote it in, mm -hmm. in high school to an imaginary girlfriend, I would say. Well, he mm -hmm. did have a few girlfriends back then, but uh, this is sort of a, not a, a one specific real one. Right. Um, and it was, a song of my brother mm. and his band when I was a teenager following them around and we when we were recording our second album uh, we didn't have many songs because we weren't actually a functioning band right. and we said how about Ziva why don't we revive this yeah. old song and and we always liked it and then I said what if I sing it because yeah. at the time Ami was singing it right. and we thought it was hilarious it was such a good joke yeah. that I would sing it um, and then I did, and the record company heard it, and they said, oh, what is this song? It's ridiculous you're not putting that on the album. And we said, well, actually we are, because we really like it, and then it became the big hit. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so so the song, I think, that they were referring to back in 89 yeah. of, of the first album was Marble Woman. Okay. You uh, also started doing a lot of Soundtrack, uh, soundtracks, which we're gonna, I'm gonna show a short clip soon. Is it, um, the soundtracks came, I, when did you start doing soundtracks? It's, I think. I think it came out of uh, working with uh, Frank Elfman, who is a film composer and right. a very, very accomplished one. And um, I was watching him in the studio working mm -hmm. and uh, then somebody approached us in Israel while we were here for gigs, I think around 2001, and asked us to collaborate on the on the soundtrack mm -hmm. of a, it was actually a documentary about the Holocaust. Okay. And uh, he wanted us to write it together, and so we did. And mm -hmm. so through Frank, I learned uh, the the you know the the building blocks. Right. Of it, and then just went my own way and started composing uh, a lot of uh, TV series and a lot of docu documentaries. Maybe. Right. It's, it's a completely different genre, yes? Absolutely. And it's a completely different way of working, Absolutely. I guess. Is for, for, 
for a movie, how does it work? Do you, do you, you're given the scene and then say, put this to music, or how does? I'm usually given, uh, the, the point where you involve the musician is usually uh, when you have a rough cut of the whole movie. Okay. And I watch it, and I watch it with the directors and mm -hmm. uh, editors, and we sort of uh, start throwing ideas around, and I go home and I will compose a few bits. Mm -hmm. And then we can choose the direction that we're going from there. What I like to do very much then is to wait till there is a more or less final cut for the movie and then compose to picture. Okay. I sit in my studio, I have a separate uh, screen for the movie, and I play. And I record myself playing, and then I start cutting it up and, and sorting it out, and then I send them bits and they put them in place and they mm. say it's too fast it's too slow what were you doing there <laughs> um, we love it or whatever mm. and then we continue from there <laughs> many times especially in israel i think um i can understand that uh, um, people work a little bit differently and usually you bring in the musician at the very last moment and you just they just say oh Composes ten different pieces, one minute each. A happy one, a sad one, a blah blah blah, blah and then they sort of cut them to. I, you know, I, I try not to do that. Sometimes yeah. you have to. Right, right. Especially when you do series and mm -hmm. like uh, you have uh, six episodes, and some of the music is going to repeat mm -hmm. uh, along. So they cut it to size, and uh, then you just have to work with a really good um, soundtrack editor. Right you know, uh, somebody that will blend it in right at the right place. And it, I imagine it must be hard in the sense that you are writing and you have to get approval for everything that you yeah. write, which is very yeah. different. How, yes. how is yeah. that different True. between True. doing that and all oh. your other music? Yeah, that, that took some adjusting too, mm -hmm. but I think that's a great lesson to learn in life. Mm -hmm. uh, not to always be the boss, not mm -hmm. to always, you know, just to sort of let your ego take the back seat for a minute here and that's a great thing to learn for musicians and performing music like um you know it's like the difference between a dj that uh does weddings and and you know and mm -hmm. bar mitzvahs and stuff right. and the dj that does uh the clubs because yeah. when i play a club people come to hear me and mm -hmm. what i have to bring mm -hmm. and when you do a wedding you absolutely have to play what they want. It's right. their big day. So composing is a sort of a mixture between the two. And yeah. that's a, a very good lesson to learn in life, really, to yeah. sort of listen to other people and their sort of vision. And many times it's projects that they've been working on for years and years before you come along. And all you have to do is really push the scenes, highlight, what they wanted. Uh, sometimes it's stopping the music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's like Miles Davis said, and it's what you don't play. Yeah. You know, it's many times it's just a very scary scene, and you stop the music, and the silence is what really creeps you out. So you sort of want to understand what the director wants to do, and you are their servant. Mm -hmm. And being a servant is. Something I think that our society today sort of really tries to get away from. Everybody wants to be a boss. And uh, I think that's a very uh, humbling and important lesson was for me mm. uh, to do this. Do you think you could have done it as a younger musician or do you think you had to be more no. mature? No, I didn't have the patience or the scope. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't think so. Um, so we have a clip here today of some uh, uh, some. Um, this is my latest project, yeah, actually. Uh, I think it's uh, from one of the I think creepiest old movies ever made. I don't know if anyone has ever um, seen uh, Nosferatu. It's I think a 1922 uh, German expressionist movie. Silent movie. Yeah, uh, no dialogue um, for a movie that does not have like boo moments, like. Uh, Today, scary movies all have like someone jumping from a closet. This has none of that. It is strictly visual and it is like 
Super disturbing. So uh, basically, <laughs> what I was uh, asked to write a new uh, soundtrack for that, mm -hmm. uh, which is again very different from anything I've ever done because it's there has no dialogue and. Um, basically, what I do now is I'm just starting a world tour where I am uh, touring with Nosferatu, with the movie. Not and actually with Nosferatu, I yeah, guess, right? Of course. Well, he's with yeah. me everywhere, <laughs> yes, in my dreams, yeah. too. And um, I perform the soundtrack, all 90 minutes of it, wow. live with in front of the film, like right. at the side of the stage. Right. Uh, and I created a whole new arsenal of equipment for this, which mm. is uh, this guitar that m m me and Perry Atia that works with me, we rewired this guitar in a really geeky, wonderful way. And um, uh, a, a couple of really old uh, 90 samplers mm. that are I control with hand movements. Um, and that's how I perform the whole, the whole thing. It's, 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 that's, um, I think, the, the most special thing I've, I've ever done. It's, it's one of these projects that you know that sometimes you work on something and everything is right from the beginning. Do you know, it's organically, everything just falls into place. And um, it, it's an in, it, insane amount of music. Mm -hmm. if, I, if you do a, a music for a, a documentary that is an hour and a half long, you normally, if you do... 25 music, uh, minutes of music, it's a lot. Yeah? And here we have 90 something wow. minutes of continuous mm. playing. So you are playing for 90 minutes, like straight. Right, for mm. the whole, for all of the conferences. Are, are you releasing a version, like, you know, that yeah, people can, it, can watch it, yeah. as well with this? Um, watch is a, <coughs> th there's a lots of rights issues mm. here right. with, the, um, with the film. But the soundtrack will be released. Yes. So the, the original film is still under copyright. Um, it belongs to the. It's a whole. Okay. There's a whole right. <laughs> issue there. Whose idea was yeah. it to uh, to to do this? Well, there is a um, Yashiv Cohen. He's a singer of uh, uh, Men of North Country, which is a Tel Aviv band that plays uh, Northern Soul. They're a mm. wonderful band, mm. and he does a lot of other cultural things as well. And he uh, met me in the street one day. We started talking guitars, as we do. And he said, uh, why don't I hook you up with the Cinematheque in Herzliya to do something? I don't know what. And we were sitting there for a while, and it was actually Nir Neiman from the Cinematheque in Herzliya, who's very passionate about movies. He said, why don't we do Nos Nosferatu? It's time it got a, mm -hmm. a new soundtrack. And so we did that for Purim. <laughs> Mm -hmm. which right. they had like a um, a whole weekend of uh, horror movies right and then we did it for the first time and now it's I'm starting to tour with it so is um, when you choose movies do you have a particular type of movie or genre movie like do you like horror movies or actually no <laughs> I have to say and uh, um, people who uh, know me like my wife and my kids my teenage kids they heard that I'm going to score a, a 
a, a horror movie and they laughed so hard. <laughs> it's like, I'm squeamish. Uh, I will hide under the sofa with the dog if anything scary is happening uh, um, on the screen. Um, so it's very different than anything I've ever done, but uh, that's also a very uh, freeing experience. Uh, because you not only had to watch it, you had to write something that enhanced the frightening feeling of yeah. the movie, which yeah. is... Frightening, but also there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, firstly, I would say it is uh, aesthetically the most beautiful film I have ever seen, mm. really. Each and every scene there is meticulously filmed uh, and um, um, shown, and a lot of the frames there have become very iconic and uh, get referenced a lot mm -hmm. in... in other films and a lot of uh, TV, uh, children's TV shows and like even uh, SpongeBob, mm -hmm. uh, SquarePants and others. Uh, they have Nosferatu yeah. coming in at, at, at various moments. Uh, it's a, a truly uh, incredible aesthetic work of art. So uh, it gives you a great freedom to really go very far, uh, also with the electronic music and to uh, highlight. Um, uh, a lot of what they're talking about is uh, uh, hate and hate crimes mm. and uh, discrimination and being different and uh, sacrifice and uh, being brave. You know, mm. a lot of there's right. a lot of themes there. Right. Did you design the the instruments? You said like the 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 guitar you said you did, and there's the hand motion thing, how does the hand motion? The hand motion things is like, uh, uh, they're uh, old uh, Roland samplers that I've had forever, mm. and I've always uh, used them live, but uh, all of a sudden I realized that in this project, they're going to take the front seat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they were, uh, they're going to drive this, this right. soundtrack. So it was designed as much for the, the, the live performance aspect of it as well as the, the, the musical the, aspect of they're it. They're just samplers that mm. people were able to buy right. mm, always, but mm, I don't think they've been used much mm. with the hand movements. Uh, oh, so the hand movements come like built in? Yes. It? Wow. Yeah, it's an old technology that Roland bought from okay. somebody years ago, right. and it didn't quite catch on and right. like a theremin me, type of a thing yes yeah. but in a, mm -hmm. yeah you could, I could use the hand movements to trigger actual samples or right. I can use them to actually play a synth mm -hmm. a synth line mm -hmm. or I, I can use them to trigger uh, sorry geek talk here mm -hmm. um, can, can uh, Hold on, who am I saying this to? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it's the only place in the world where I can. Um, I can use it to tr to also trigger and uh, control mm. effects. Mm. So I can have something playing. I can, with my finger, push uh, a sample. And then with my hand, I can uh, move the pitch or put delay on it or reverb. And uh, actually, with the movie, sort of, uh, really go with his movements and, and control the mm. sound that's coming out of the sampler. Is it tiring? Yeah, by the end of it, I'm, I'm, uh, my heart is going like 140 beats per minute. But, yeah. um, uh, uh, and afterwards, I have to sort of collapse for a little <laughs> bit. It's, um, uh, you have to be, for an hour and a half, mm. have absolute uh, concentration. Mm. I guess it's like a football match. Mm -hmm. Is it different every time? It's, it's different every time. Well, Slightly, yeah. It's like a live show. It's a live show, yeah. <laughs> it's a live show. Um, I mean, it's synced to the movie, right. and what sequence is going to come up is the same, but the layers over it are different every time, yeah. Um, so you do DJ work now? How did you get into being a DJ? Um, Funny story, um, it was the year 2000, we just released a Pollyanna Frank album here um, with me and Frank Elfman and uh, we finished the tour and I went to Greece, to mm. Lesbos, mm. Uh, to stay for a while, to mm -hmm. just kind of come down and uh, recharge and a friend of mine has a bar kind of on the beach. Mm. 
and there was a DJ booth with the sound system and everything, the equipment there. And I asked her if I could just um, goof around with the equipment and just taught myself how to kind of use it, mm -hmm. kind of use it. And um, there was a party uh, on the beach that night, and mm -hmm. I asked the DJ. I said, if you know, if I could, uh, if I help you um, carry all the equipment, all the sound system to the sand to the beach, will you let me play a little bit before everybody arrives? And she said, Yeah, of course. And it was about 10 o'clock and I was just goofing around a little bit, but we still with CDs. And um, she sat right next to me in the sand and all of a sudden I saw that she's passed out. <laughs> and uh, it turned out that she was diabetic, but she didn't know at the time. Mm. And she had some vodka right. and mm. she passed out. We could not right. revive her. So I played till the morning. Mm. And uh, in the morning, I the sun came up and I thought, mm, I could do this. Wow. So I, I, that feeds your live, like your need for live yeah, performance. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. And I, I needed a change as well after right. uh, it was already like a good 13 years or more, like many years in the music business and mm -hmm. all the heartache that comes with it. And uh, I, I needed a bit of a change and that was really, really good. So right. I immediately started DJing. And, um, so it, it, being a DJ is very ephemeral, the music isn't recorded um is is that sometimes hard for you because like some i imagine when you're composing or, or you're recording you get to hear it afterwards you get to disseminate it with this it just goes away well i mainly um uh, dj tracks that were composed by other people right um so when i dj i'm, I'm more of a curator right or a selector i okay. decide Okay. Out of everything that's out there every month, mm -hmm. what to buy and what to play mm -hmm. and what would suit my audience and how to build mm -hmm. it up. And many times I will uh, actually uh, uh, record the set so mm -hmm. you can hear it okay. over and over again or we broadcast it live. Or, right. um, and um, so that's right. r really not a... Okay. And I mean, yeah, you can listen to it again. Okay. I, we, we have the technology to repeat parts of tracks, right. loop them, uh, change the pitch mm -hmm. while we're... So all these things that you do live, if you record the set, right. they, they're still there. And was that like something that you were already good at that you had to improve? Like, because I imagine it's, it's reading an audience. It's the, is the, the essential skill there is understanding and reading an audience. Yeah. Um, is that something you were already really good at? I was all right. Yeah. I was okay. Right. But I feel the other way around that uh, being a <coughs> DJ has improved my uh, crowd reading skills for being a singer. Yeah. Because you really have to. I mean, if yeah. you don't really pay attention to right. the audience right. as a DJ, you're just going to lose the floor. Mm -hmm. It's going to empty, mm -hmm. and yeah. you, you, you know, you feel it. Yeah. You can really see it. Um, so it, I had to learn. Wow. Quite quickly. Absolutely. So it's, but it's something that I don't think you can teach. Mm. You can teach people to pay attention. Other DJs, you can, I teach mm -hmm. DJing also. And there's only so much I can teach a young DJ to what to look out for. But if they don't mm. have it within themselves, I guess some people are just better at it than right. others. Right. When you came back to Israel after so many years outside of Israel and, and being engaged in, in larger music scenes outside of Israel, what did you find different about the Israeli music scene and, and what did you think about that? Mm, I have to be very honest here, as I am honest. I think the, the, uh, when I came back around 2002, uh, actually the music scene here I found um, not so uh, interesting at the time. It was not a very good time, and I think uh, since then things have changed in a way that uh, I, I, it's very hard to believe that, that it's less than 20 years ago. Um, I think that what's happening now in Israeli music is absolutely incredible, the amount of talent that is around. And I think what happened was people here... Um, we're trying to imitate foreign music, be it German or American or 
whatever Greek at some point um, or Turkish and at the moment a lot of people are doing really original stuff and uh, people have started to dig deep and see what's, what they grew up on and what they like now and sort of amalgamate it and uh, the music scene here is incredible and actually a lot of people from outside Israel think that as well so at the time it wasn't so interesting but now it's fantastic. Uh, I'm also a fan. Um, uh, about Israeli music, uh, so uh, I remember one of my favorite songs from the uh, Elif Hall from it was uh, Escape with All Will Always Fail. And, um, and I remember at the time that uh, it wasn't very, uh, I mean, uh, both the, the, the lyrics were, were uh, original strains, they, they were not uh, the, the, what you, you hear on the radio. Uh, and but there was uh, just a bit like political stuff. Uh, if you remember, I showed a story. Um, mm -hmm. uh, maths. Maths, yeah. Maths. Mm -hmm. Or but uh, and then afterwards, Melia mm -hmm. Uh But there's not much uh, political. Political, yeah. So uh, and I, I I I must admit I don't know your current works. But, uh, do you do, still do such things or? Yes, I do. Um, I still do also yeah political stuff definitely and also when I DJ I like to cut up bits of um, speeches or things that I hear from uh, poets and writers that I like and I would DJ that over tracks while I'm DJing and it could be anything from uh, from uh, Michelle Obama to a, a poet I like like Versailles Shire or you know so I put still a lot of contact it, like th there'll be a lot in the music um it doesn't necessarily have to be about the occupation it could be but um yes i still do that a lot do you feel that you need to to be uh, away from the place or actually inside to to do such like, political stuff? i think um your home is here in your heart and it doesn't matter where you are it's you know where your heart is it's what what your attention focuses on and big part of my attention is always here it doesn't matter where i am when's your and where's your next performance of uh, nasratu uh i believe that would be istanbul right. in september and okay. then go on to okay and it will be a tel aviv one uh, this year sometime I'm not sure oh okay it's um, being it's all now being booked great and um, any other uh, dates that you have locally coming up I DJ with Ofer Nisim who is I suppose the biggest DJ in Israel mm. um, we do uh, we have these uh, four times a year huge parties our last pride party in the summer was 20,000 people wow. uh, so mm -hmm. we have another one in Rosh Hashanah, mm -hmm. and uh, there's many like smaller uh, uh, dates, and uh, I'm lucky enough to take part in uh, Festival Mekudeshet in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. a sacred music festival, which is I has to be one of my favorite festivals ever, and luckily enough this year I'm part of it. Um, uh, there's a, a brilliant a band called uh, System Ali, who are a multilingual, multicultural rap band, mm -hmm. and uh, they're taking over. Um, they're like opening a like a discotheque in East Jerusalem for a couple of weeks, and I'm going to do some of the nights there and have uh, live spoken word. Uh, Adi Kaysar, the poetess, will come and talk do spoken word over my beats and mm -hmm. uh, Samira Saraya, other, other, other women. So we're doing like a, a female sound system. So that's going to be in September as well. It's going to be lovely. I really wanted to thank you very much for coming to uh, speak with us today. And, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Pleasure.